So please join with me in welcoming Dr. Kian. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very comfortably supported by all the devices around me, so I'm not going to move too much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I feel it's important to tell you that what, uh, tell you what brings me joy in science um, is when I find the great metaphors. Um, and uh, when I find the great metaphors that can inspire solutions across disciplines. So these are uh, two of my favorite books. Uh, they remind me that it's always possible to reimagine how we do science. And um, a new language for research is possible that is not restricted by semantics and how we describe our problems and solutions today. So as you are all researchers, most of you are, um, today it's very hard for us to discover um, potential inspirational solutions in fields that are outside of our own when you are doing a search on Google Scholar. Um, so I feel that is a fundamental limitation. So that's the opening. Um, the talk is structured into um, three parts. So I will talk about uh, three problems and three solutions and the future. So first, here is the, the problem. Problem one is that we do not know how to measure good security. We have about 8 billion people on the planet, uh, 300 billion passwords, but still there is about 3 million lost to cybercrime every minute. So that's my field for a very long time. This inf infographic shows large breaches um, in the last three years that impacted over 30,000 records. Um, cyber risk has been consistently rated among the top 10 global risks. 60% of small businesses go out of business within six months after a cyber attack. Cyber risk is big because of two things. First, um, is that we are putting more value online um, and we are increasingly um, putting higher value online. Second is that the internet wasn't invented to be secure. It was invented as a, a, set, as a set of communication protocols. Um, so security was, has always been an after, afterthought. Cybersecurity is like a game, and today we know it very well that it is a technical game. But the fallacy is that threats come from the outside. That is why the traditional security model looks like this. Everything is built around the wall, um, separating trusted systems from untrusted systems. But the reality is more like this. We have learned that now, actually, the walls we build are more like eggshells, and the threats more often come from the inside. The main driver for cloud migration today is better security that is built into modern infrastructure that is designed based on zero trust. As the technology, as the technical game continues, the question is, uh, what is the end game? How to achieve optimal security? Optimal security is not having five layers of bulletproof doors in a neighborhood that has no crime. Optimal security is when it is good enough, but how do we know when it's good enough? As I spend more time with chief security officers of the largest companies in the world, I understand cybersecurity is an economic game. Good enough is not to spend more than what is needed. Good enough is achieved when the cost to break is higher than the cost to build. The optimal security model has monetary value on it, and it should look like this. We should know the value we are protecting in dollar value, like you have a rough idea of how much of your household belongings are worth. We should know how much of it is at risk, like what is measured in a standard property insurance policy. We should know how much of it, uh, how much it costs to reduce risk to acceptable levels, like it takes um, a 10 minute phone call to get an insurance policy, in insurance quote for your property insurance. Ideally, we should also know how to measure return on investment. And today it is possible uh, when governments around the world plan infrastructure safety like road safety to know how much um, uh, reduction in car accidents are achieved uh, through more investment. So it has been done. Today in cyber, most of these components either do not exist at all or is based on um, expert judgment, guesswork, qualitative metrics, or inconsistent data sets. Cybersecurity investment is primarily driven by fear, doubt, and uncertainty. 
So the question is how to convert that into rational decision making. But why all of this is so hard? It is because the second problem, that more fundamentally, we do not know the value of our digital assets. So this is the second problem. Can you put a number on all of your data on Google Drive the same way as your household belongings? But today, digital assets are the backbone of global economy. We know what happens there by the minute, and it is growing exponentially. But what exactly are digital assets? Apparently, today, we don't have a consistent understanding. International organizations like the IMF, OECD, European Commission, even United Nations have different definitions of them. Companies today cannot trade without a trademark. In 1957, NICE classification was established jointly by countries around the world to categorize goods and services we trade. Today, it covers little things like shoelaces, buttons, plasters. There is over 10 categories of shampoos, over 20 categories of nail products. But we do not have such a common taxonomy for digital assets. There is also no accounting standards defining how digital assets should be reported on the balance sheet anywhere closer, close to the granularity we have in the physical world. This is why even the biggest companies in the world cannot put dollar values to their assets. Another issue is that a large portion of digital value could be invisible according to our current measure. The reported digital economy is only 7% of the overall GDP in the US. This sounds like an underestimation because some of the world's most influential technology companies are American. In the meantime, over 90% adults in the US have access to fast speed internet. So what happens if we turn off the internet? Imagine driving with paper maps, writing and collaborating on paper, sending snail mails, searching for answers to your questions manually in libraries. In some cases, the, the non-digital alternative may not even be feasible. So losing access to the digital option can cause significant loss of time and productivity of the workforce. But because access to such digital services are often free, it is not counted when we measure digital economy. And this leads to the third problem, that we do not have a value theory that is adapted to our time. I, um, there is a body of literature available uh, focused on the, uh, studying the unique nature of various types of digital assets. So I looked into um, prior research and uh, summarized into um, a list of uh, unique attributes. For example, um, duplication does not increase digital value. Two cars means doubled value. Two documents means same or reduced value if information becomes inconsistent. Digital value creation does not decrease, but increase through usage. Gumtree is a marketplace to sell second-handed physical goods at cheaper price, but Gumtree itself becomes more valuable when more people use it. Digital value reproduction requires much lower or even zero cost. Just think about copying file, etc. That's why digital platforms can scale so fast, and that's why Instagram brought down Kodak with only 13 employees. Digital value can be distributed via multi-sided markets. So this is how value, the uniqueness of value distribution in digital. A bookstore is a one-sided market where there's uh, the seller sell to one set of customers. Amazon is a multi-sided market. Um, there are multiple sellers and multiple customers. The network effect became the core value generating, uh, the core value generator for the business. Um, this is the driver behind platform economy. Based on all of this, I concluded that digital value is limitless. So that is a very bold statement. Um, it does not mean our resources are unlimited. It is more like the unlimited options to play the game of Go. Um, current economic theories are based on scarcity, but digital value breaks this fundamental assumption. The limitless of digital asset come from two things. First, once the owner has created intrinsic value, the asset becomes more valuable the more it is used. So it doesn't depreciate. Second, because of the network effect, 
there are no limits in terms of opportunities to distribute and consume such value. This makes in intellectual property critical to digital value creation. And we are already in the knowledge economy, so that's <coughs> so. Um, I'm sure you have read Superintelligence and Second Machine Age, and they, they tell us that we are at a historical tipping point for human progress. And it looks like what is in the chart. Historically, major developments in our value theory have been driven by industrial revolutions. In the first industrial revolution, machines and factories were invented, and that's when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. Electric power and mass production were invented during the second industrial revolution. That's when marginal revolution happened. So that's the supply, demand, and equilibrium. The digital economy has played a central role in the third and now fourth, or we call th three plus industrial revolution, but we do not um, yet have a major economic breakthrough that can explain the new ways how value is created, distributed, and consumed. So here's the summary of three problems that are interlinked together. Uh, first, we do not know how to measure good enough security. Second, we do not know the value of our digital assets. Third, we do not have a value theory that is adapted to our time. And now everybody is really frustrated. Is now is the beginning of some solutions, and um, I think beginning is the key word. Um, so the first solution is to define a new way to categorize assets and new valuation models. Today, digital assets are often categorized based on their technical functions, such as software, hardware, database, robots, uh, AI, et cetera, digital media. I created a new way to categorize digital assets based on their economic functions. It has two dimensions. The first dimension differentiates core value assets from supportive assets. Core value assets is what the business is. Think software for software companies, tech products for tech companies, algorithms for deep learning companies. Supportive assets are how the business is run. Think office productivity tools, messaging apps, the second dimension differentiates um, digi digitized assets from digital native assets. Digitized assets have an equivalent or sibling in the physical world. E-commerce came from commerce, e-governance came from governance. On the contrary, digital native assets are born digital, such as the internet, cloud, blockchain, cryptocurrency, and artificial intelligence. So now we look at the valuation models. Um, Existing valuation models can be used for digital assets. We can measure software using intrinsic value, which come from the cost of production, IP, labor, etc. We can measure the value of your credit card number, your personal data using market value, which is based on the price it is being sold in the black market today. We can measure the value of your digital diary using um, subjective value, which is based on how much you are waiting to pay if it's lost. Um, this also applies to a Facebook likes. For many digitized assets, one part of their value comes from the physical equivalent, for example, digitized photos, documents, videos, etc. cetera. Um, the second part of digitized assets, the second part of value um, of the uh, digitized assets come from usage value. So that is part of the new valuation models. So usage value is correlated with user base to reflect the fact that the more an asset is used, the more valuable it becomes. And usage value is the main driver behind digitization and also the uh, mega valuation of many uh, tech IPOs. Um, because once a photo is taken, digitizing it, increasing how many people can access it, as well as the shelf life. You upload once and it's available everywhere, and including this talk, right? Um, opportunity value is another new valuation model, so it is related to the concept of opportunity cost. Um, it measures the value of using the digital option compared to the non-digital alternative. For example, using Google Maps compared to paper maps, using Google Search compared to manual search. Sometimes the non-digital alternative may not exist. For example, 
Today, the most valued tech startups are all born in the cloud and may not have existed in the first place if cloud wasn't invented. So this combined with the common freemium model today lead to the paradox of opportunity value that is um, that a free digital asset can have infinite value for the lack of alternative. This is how everything fit together. I was able to use three equations for the valuation of all assets using these metrics. And um, I love the beauty of simplicity. Um, so what is also interesting is that this matrix also reflects the biggest trends in technology today. Um, as you know, every industry is going through rapid digitization. So we find uh, digitization of everything here. So when core value uh, asset of industries are being digitized. And they are going in different paces, obviously. Um, cyber is becoming the new critical infrastructure, and we find it here. Uh, so that's where all the supportive assets are. And uh, this is the land of the unicorn. So all the tech unicorns um, are in the space of digital native. Um, and uh, so that's where the high concentration of exponential value lies. So the second solution um, is to come up with a digital theory of value that can help summarize and explain the unique phenomena seen in the digital economy. Um, it introduces six laws, but we will only cover a few highlights today. The first one is the law of machine time. We all know Moore's law has been driving productivity growth in computing. The supercomputer built um, for complex nuclear uh, simulations in 1996 cost 55 million, taking up to 148 square meters. Ten years later, the same computing capacity was crammed into a Sony PlayStation 3. Um, but humans are inherently limited to comprehend such exponential growth that is close to 90 degrees. So I translated Moore's law into a time scale that we can really understand. If we use the progress in 2000 as a base year, we have achieved over 4,000 years of progress in 2018. This means our current policy and regulatory cycles are inherently lagged behind. We are solving today's problem from the Stone Age. In the early days of the web, we copied the physical world into the virtual space and invented emails, e-commerce, etc. Whereas today, because the gravity of value is in the digital native, the physical world is rather accommodating the virtual space. There is a generation of digital nomads running online businesses from anywhere in the world. Remote and flexible work is common in multinational companies. Freelancers are predicted to be the majority um, of workforce in the US within a decade. In China, access to e-commerce has brought the poorest villages into prosperity. The negative side is sometimes I don't know whether my device are following me or I'm following them. Um, we will also see the return of subjective value. Today we are so used to getting the same products like everyone else, from the supermarket to cars to furniture. But before mass production was invented, bespoke solutions, uh, bespoke and customized solutions were the mainstream. Mass production was invented to minimize cost of labor and maximize efficiency. But labor and efficiency are no longer important um, in the machine age. We will see the return of subjective value because of the demand of customization and the need to be entertained when people will work much less. It's important to know that today the willingness to pay is not only measured in dollars, but also in time and attention. Think Netflix, experience design, stylist apps, and VR gaming. Finally, of course, the robots are coming. Um, we have progressed from the pyramid to Windows 95. That's when I started coding. Um, we have been constructing a virtual civilization. If the future of governance is like an operating system, it will create a new div division of labor that looks like this. There will be people who cannot keep up or below barrier to entry. This brings the discussion around new necessities in terms of digital literacy and access to device and tools. Then there will be human labor that supports the operating system. 
you have heard that the next blue collar job is coding. And then there will be conventional human labor that is difficult to be automated um, because deep learning is still inherently limited. At least for many decades to come, optimal intelligence will be a combination of human and machines. Finally, on top of the value chain, there is human labor that there is human labor that participate in the job creation in the new, in the new economy. Um, it's very hard to predict whether we will play a role there because according to superintelligence, you know, the, how we end up with AI, we don't know. Um, but I'm very optimistic. So I believe that accuracy is not the same as truth, so computers cannot replace philosophers. Um, so now it's the third solution. Um, the third solution is to create, a, create new units to measure cyber risk. Um, I find risk is a beautiful field because it's, um, it's a perfect balance between facts and perception. So it's both objective and subjective. It sits perfectly in the intersection between natural science and social science. The most dangerous part of a flight is the drive to the airport. Um, more people die from falling coconuts than from shark attacks. Um, as you know that we cannot manage what we can't measure, uh, but we are able to measure risk today, just not in cyber. So it has been done in, in other fields, like uh, uh, measuring mortality risk and market risk. And that's where I got inspiration from to um, build units for cyber. So I got inspired by, I mean, it's also quite metaphoric. Um, I got inspired by um, two units. So the first one is um, called Micromod, and it's a risk measure for mortality risk. Um, so the data is based on 400 years of collection from how people die uh, from different risk factors, both inherent, uh, genetic, and external, uh, lifestyle choices, etc. cetera. Um, but the math model was only introduced a few decades ago, and um, in 1989, um, um, Micromod was first proposed academically um, in Stanford, and today it is behind every life insurance policy we have. Um, so one Micromod is one in a million probability of death. So that is the objective measure because it's based on statistics and data points, having the right data points, and that's been done through statistical bureaus around the world. Um, the value of one micromod is how much um, a person is willing to pay to reduce one micromod. So that is highly subjective because two people can be exposed to the same risk of smoking, but they can react differently. So a fun fact is that one micromod is 40 tablespoons of peanut butter. So we have, we have been able to measure risk to that level of granularity. Um, so I find it very interesting uh, because there is definitely similarities in cyber and, uh, for example, we know in financial services as an industry, every organization is exposed very much to similar risk profiles, but uh, control implementation can be very different from different companies, so that's a combination of objective and subjective um, measures. So the second unit is called value at risk. Uh, you probably are more familiar with that because it's widely used by traders and business people around the world. Um, so it was also um, academically introduced not so long time ago, uh, but the, the, the breakthrough happened when JP Morgan uh, built a database based on that theory and um, um, released a product called the Risk Matrix. And then it became open source and um, it created the profession of quant, which is the highest paid profession today. So VAR essentially is a unit to measure the likelihood of losing certain amount of money in a given time frame. Uh, so it's very much a probability of something happening to your money. And that is purely uh, objective, right? Like not like there is no subjectivity like what we see in Micromod in VAR. Um, so how did I bring this to cyber? Uh, so on the, asset um, on the asset level, I defined uh, a unit called Bitmort, so that's very much like Micromod. 
Um, it has the objective measure, which is one in a million probabilities of digital death. So we can still adjust whether it's a million or a trillion. We don't know because we have to start from somewhere to collect the data. And then it can be changed. Um, but it's important to note that um, there is a concept of digital death when an asset loses all of its economic value. So you can't lose half of your credit card number. You either have it or you don't. Um, a, a, a device is uh, obsolete or it's not. So it's a binary condition. Um, the subjective measure of micromod is the value um, an entity is willing to pay to reduce it um, to reduce one, one bit more. So that's very similar to micromod. Um, so Hecla, um, this is the this is Icelandic volcano, and um, it's the volcano that erupted in 2010. Um, so it looks like uh, a VAR curve. And also, I was traveling um, in Iceland in 2014 when I was looking for the name of the unit. So I decided to name it after the second largest uh, active volcano in Iceland uh, called Hekla. So Hekla is inspired by value at risk. So on a company level or so everybody, like individual company or global level, it's aggregation of digital assets. So when asset value are aggregated, we should be able to uh, measure the probability of losing certain uh, so certain economic loss from aggregated digital value. Um, so the objective measure of Hecla is like VAR um, is your loss minute uh, the 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 loss limit. So it's a probability um, over a certain period uh, the likelihood of losing. Um, uh, uh, a, a, a certain amount of money from cyber um, incidents. So, but I added the subjective uh, measure to Hecla, which is um, the amount um, of money the entity is willing to pay to reduce it by 1%. Um, so for example, there is a 5% likelihood that a company is gonna lose 100 million in the next 12 months from cyber attacks. How much this company is willing to pay to reduce that to 4%. Um, and every company can decide differently. So that is how companies price their risk and also reflects their risk appetite. So going back to the optim optimal security model, now we can actually uh, measure almost all of these components. And um, so we will not go into the details of the application of the calculation, but I'm just showing that this is how um, we can apply um, the pair of two units um, to move towards a more quantitative way of understanding what is good enough security. So the summary of the three solutions, um, one is creating new ways to categorize assets and new valuation models. Second is creating a new theory of value. And the third is creating new units to measure cyber risk. And I hope that you also understand how these three concepts are interconnected somehow. Um, cool. So now what is the, the future? Sorry, my Mac is not really working with um, Google slide. Um, the future. And uh, so cybernomics is a body of study dedicated to the three problems because they are all big problems. And it takes many years to solve them. Um, so that's why this is just the beginning. And uh, how to make it work? Um, there are three levels. Uh, so there is uh, the entity level, which is, which is individual companies, organizations, um, and what kind of data needs to be collected. Um, and how do we try to put a dollar value on our data, right? And the second is portfolio level, that is uh, industry verticals, such as uh, financial services or nation states, when countries are coming up with their digital policy, um, cyber policies and strategy. Um, and then it's the go global level where um, new standards need to be created and um, you know, accounting standards need to be created. Um, and also uh, more data sharing partnership because there is a lot of proprietary data today uh, around security that are not really publicly available. 
Um, but what I find is more, in, more important is when we look at the future value, knowing that digital is exponential, and we are on this almost 90 degree curve um, of growth, it's very important to look at the other two pillars of the future value, which is well-being and sustainability. And I think people are already very aware that uh, digital and technology can be highly intrusive. Um, and there has been anti-technology movements when I travel um, um, to tech conferences. And uh, so it's important to know um, how much time we want to spend with technology versus with people, right? So that's uh, one example. And, uh, and Avi, my host, is working on exciting projects around uh, longevity. So that's another you know, side to how to live better and live well. Um, sustainability is fundamental. So um, I think the unlimited potential in the virtual space has implication implication on still hardware and you know overall energy consumption, and that is still limited. Um, we're producing a lot of devices, and you know they are not getting recycled. So there is a technical, there is a resource constraint there still. Um, but in cloud, that you know the reason why I'm happy uh, working in cloud is that it's a much greener infrastructure, right? So. Um, I think it's important to balance um, um, with sustainability. Um, so that is uh, said by a, a very um, important engineer at Google, uh, one of the earliest uh, employees. So he uh, spoke at Berkeley and he said, um, limitless computing has arrived. Um, so what is the new scarcity? I think that is an important question um, because now that we know digital value is limitless in a sense, then we need to find a new scarcity. Is that our attention or is the battery power, which is probably not true? Um, and uh, so I think it's important to think about this. Um, I will end my talk with this. So my friend Tuli was visiting two weeks ago, and she took these photos on a sunny morning. Uh, so there are birds that are enjoying the sun um, in Hyde Park, um, and uh, they are you know, just chilling out in a line. And in the same moment, people are rushing into work through the streets and ignoring you know, the environment. Um, so I, I think going back to the chart, you know, when we are um, ahead of a 90 degree curve, um, which means exponential growth. Um, probably it's also a time to think about radical change and reimagine what do we mean by progress and value. So we could potentially do this completely differently um, because the history of economics has been around production and, um, um, and what if we don't need to produce more than everything else is open to thinking and philosophy. Um, so that's everything. And um, I have a course coming soon. So you can sign up for the course from my website. And uh, now I think we're open for questions.